so yeah, welcome to this webinar, the Toilet Trade, How to Sell Sanitation Successfully and to Scale, uh, hosted by Susanna, joined um, by IDE and Witten and Roy Partnership. So my name is Connie Benjamin, I'm based in WaterAge UK, and I work supporting the development of Susanna as part of a Gates Foundation grant. I'll be introducing today's webinar and the presenters. So, Market-based approaches like sanitation marketing have become an accepted way to increase wash impacts at scale. Inherent in a market system are market transactions, which can be reduced to the basic acts of buying and selling. However, this is not as easy as designing a great toilet that will sell itself. During this webinar, we will focus on selling toilets successfully and discussing what to do and what not to do when building sanitation sales capability with Witten and Roy Partnership and how IDE, a market-based NGO, has used direct sales strategies to reach accelerated scale. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome our presenters today, who are Scott Roy. Uh, Scott Roy is co-CEO and co-founder of Witten & Roy Partnership, which is a sales management consultancy that serves NGOs, social enterprises, and socially-minded businesses. Scott has over 40 years of experience in building direct sales organizations, first in the USA in publishing and insurance, and for the past 10 years globally for many sectors. To date, Witten & Roy Partnership has delivered more than 200 sales transformation projects in 27 developing countries, including Cambodia, Laos, Nepal, Mali, Benin, Ghana, to name a few. Scott and Witten & Roy Partnership have extensive experience in designing and transforming sanitation marketing programs, having partnered with organizations such as IDE, Population Services International, PSI, Sanergy, SNB, um, and many others. Witten & Roy Partnership work with clients who want to build or transform sales and private sector capability within their organizations and in products they projects they want to conduct. And many of their clients want to build a permanent and sustainable private sector presence after a project ends. So a big welcome to Scott. Thank you for joining us. Our second presenter is Yi Wei. Uh, Yi is a prominent water, sanitation and hygiene sector leader known for her track record of designing, managing and implementing market development programs that effectively blend innovation and scale. Yi's specialties include human-centered design, microfinance, social enterprise, leadership development and women's economic empowerment. Yi was instrumental in growing the Cambodian flagship sanitation program to a global portfolio of six countries that is the largest rural sanitation market development program delivering improved latrines in the sector to date. IDE is a global effort that spans offices in 14 countries, encompassing four social enterprises, employing over 1,000 people directly and indirectly, enabling many more through their market-based approaches in agriculture, water sanitation and hygiene and finance. IDE's WASH work spans six countries, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Ghana, Nepal, and Vietnam. And cumulatively, IDE has facilitated the sale of over 1.2 million WASH projects, products. The webinar today will last approximately 60 minutes with time for questions after the two presentations. You can ask questions in the chat box as we go, and I'll put them to the presenters later. You can also press the raise hand button at the top of your screen um, and after the presentations, we will unmute your microphone and you can ask your questions directly. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Scott. Thank you, Connie. Uh, great to uh, be on this uh, webinar today with everyone. Um, uh, I must say that uh, 10 years ago when um, I became involved in doing projects in the developing world, I never believed, uh, I never would have believed that I, uh, you know, could look back in, in 10 years' time and see us do uh, about 50 sanitation projects. Uh, it, it's uh, really quite amazing. In fact, Yi and I uh, were on our first project of uh, a sanita a nature of sanitation uh, with IDE many, many years ago. So uh, this was back in 2011. Uh, you know, when Yi was just starting with IDE, and, and this was our first sanitation project. So uh, it's uh, really great to be on, the, on, on this webinar with you, Yi. So, um, you know, uh, what, what we're going to be talking about today is about taking a market-based approach, and, and specifically the area of expertise that we work with is in sales, sales management, and leadership development. And, and uh, uh, essentially, this is uh, a fairly new 
subject or newer subject in development, as everyone knows, uh, going from uh, giveaways to now taking market-based approaches and selling uh, to uh, you know the populations at the base of the pyramid. And um, so, although sales is a is a very complex subject. Uh, today, I'm just going to be focusing on what I would call the, the five uh, big rocks. In other words, these are major uh, things that organizations must face if they're going to set up a successful sales operation. And um, so I'm looking forward to sharing this with you and then answering your questions at the end. So uh, without further ado, um, let's, uh, let's move into the problem uh, with setting up a sales organization that's going to be successful. Um, and you know, quite frankly, this is quite new to many people who are traditional players in uh, the developing world. Many come from an NGO or, or a background or from a service or mission-oriented uh, uh, angle. And so selling uh, is sometimes you know, can be uh, embraced. Oftentimes it's rejected or pushed away because of some of the things that people think about selling. You know, selling is you know, trying to convince people to buy things. Uh, that uh, that they don't really need, you know, and oftentimes that, that's what the um, the bad uh, rap that sales has. But um, we look at it quite differently. And in, in fact, some of the things that um, that uh, we we look at from a symptom standpoint, you know, from, from what the problems are that organizations we've worked with worldwide have experienced. Uh, here's just a, a just a general list. Is that you know, first is difficulty in finding good people to hire. You know, people who can perform, people who can do well at selling. Uh, and of course, that relates directly to point number two, which is um, the experiencing high churn in the sales team. And people who turn over, they start and then they don't, they don't complete, or they start and they don't perform well, so uh, they you know, get, get let go, or they go on to do other things because they can't make money at, um, at, at selling latrines or uh, selling uh, wash-type products. Um, also, what we notice is there's just a lack of development on the sales team itself. Oftentimes, the way that sales managers manage or organizations manage is, is asking people, you know, how many uh, sales did you have today? Oh, you had zero sales. Okay, well, tomorrow, go out and get two sales. Okay, and that's the, that's the, the, the extent of the development. Or um, they'll have a sales team meeting where people will get together and um, someone will bring up a problem, and the whole team comes together to try to help solve the problem. Well, that's one way to do it, but we find it's really, really ineffective to do it that way. And, um, and so therefore, you know, missing sales targets uh, is a very common uh, problem that people experience. Um, you, you obviously run into potential buyers who say, gosh, I, I'd love to have a product like this, but I have no money. And, and obviously, in the developing world, you run into this problem quite often. Um, you know, it's very interesting, and as I train around the world, one of the things that um, that I go back to in my early days, my, my very early days, uh, back in my 20s, I had started as a direct salesperson with a, a venerable company here in the United States called the Southwestern Company. It's one of, actually one of America's oldest companies. And uh, when I was a college student, I went out and sold educational books door to door. And one of the interesting things I found at, at after having done that for five summers as a college student and then going on to be a sales manager with that. Um, and, and comparing that experience with when I went to Cambodia working with voluntary service overseas on a livelihoods project and then beginning to work with IDE and agriculture and water and then sanitation. One of the things I found, and quite surprising to me, was that um, Potential buyers, when they weren't sure about whether or not they wanted to buy a, a product, whether it's a, a book or a toilet, uh, oftentimes will raise the objection of, well, I don't have the money or it's too expensive. You know? And so it was one of the things that was very surprising to me when I was in Cambodia, which was the first country I ever worked in, um, was I was hearing the same types of objections there as I did in America, where obviously in America, uh, you have less of a problem with having enough money to buy things that are reasonably priced. So immediately I began to learn that sometimes you know, we listen to the objections of people and we believe them. And we find many, many of the companies we serve, whether it's um, in the uh, solar business or in the water and sanitation business or education or wherever it might be in the developing world that we work with, 
is the same objection comes up over and over again. And unfortunately, the people who are selling uh, the products actually believe that it's true. And, uh, and actually, there's something else that's going on. Um, also, the lack of processes and systems that people have that really you know, can't be scaled up. That's another issue that we run into. And then all kinds of logistics issues with respect to you know, how, how do you sell a toilet during monsoon and then deliver it over really bad roads. You know, and, or or uh, supply chain issues with respect to selling too many. We just had this happen the other day in Uganda where we had worked with an organization and taught them how to sell uh, their biodigesters more effectively. And in the first, gosh, I think five or six days, they'd sold as many in five or six days as they had the entire previous year. And the owner of that business said, stop, you know, we can't stop, we can't sell anymore because we can't deliver it, you know. So we always have to keep an eye on supply chain issues as well. And then, and then certainly um, the, the thing that we run into time and time again is a lack of sales management experience of how do you actually train people how to sell, how do you develop them, you know, how do you manage them into performance. So, um, so these are some of the things we run into. And, and let's, let's take a look at one key thing, which is recruiting the wrong people to sell. Uh, almost instantly, what people tend to do is they look for people with sales experience. And although that really makes a lot of sense or seems like it makes a lot of sense, unfortunately, the sales experience that people have in the development context tends to come from a, um, an FMCG or fast-moving consumer goods uh, sales background. So, for example, selling cigarettes or selling SIM cards uh, or things that are very cheap and expensive and move fast. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, that experience does not sync up very well with what we would call a behavioral change sale. And getting people to wash their hands or getting people to use a, use a, a toilet rather than open defecating, et cetera, et cetera, these are, uh, it's a very, very different kind of sale. It's one where you've got to engage with people at a much deeper level for them to consider the problem that they're, that they're trying to solve, uh, although most people aren't even aware that they have much of a problem. They, they may see open defecating as an inconvenience or, or that you know, they know they probably shouldn't do that. But, uh, but fundamentally, uh, if you take an FMCG type of sales approach, which is um, I have a product and I want to convince you to buy it, then you will make some sales, but unfortunately, um, two things happen. One is many people will not buy with that approach, and then secondly, um, the, uh, the, the sales tend to be weak, and that means that people will buy something, and then later on, they end up not using what they bought. So looking for people with sales experience uh, is one of the biggest mistakes I, I found. And instead, um, you know, uh, I'll tell you in a minute about some of the lessons uh, that you can apply in this situation. Secondly, is, it, is that you assume that people already know how to sell, which obviously is not the case if they're an FMCG uh, type of uh, seller. You need someone who has more of a consultative, consultative background or a person who can carry on a conversation uh, with, with, a, with a potential client. And then thirdly, um, broadcasting job availability. It's one of the common things we see is people will advertise for jobs and you know they'll post posters and this kind of thing and then they get droves of people who come in but unfortunately um, we, we find that that's not the right way to do it. Uh, uh, having been a recruiter for about 20 some odd years earlier in my career, uh, you know, there are certain things that you want to do uh, in order to attract the right kind of talent uh, to your team. So here are some of the lessons that I would share with you. Number one is to seek learners and people who connect well. Uh, this could be people from an NGO background. Uh, they can be people who are teachers or people who are um, you know, leaders in a community, whatever. People who, are, who, who connect well with others and people who want to learn. Uh, secondly, create a consistent recruiting process. In other words, you want to have stages to the recruiting process. So first, you know, finding uh, the right people to talk to having a, des a designed sales conversation or recruiting conversation for the first meeting to, so you can interview a number of different candidates, and then having a second meeting where you actually get into maybe some practical uh, exercises where you can see people in uh, practical um, sort of role plays and things like that where you can get a sense of how well they might perform. Um, and so you can set up a consistent recruiting uh, process that includes um, 
an onboarding process and, um, and uh, uh, certain agreements that you put in place with people um, in, in what we call a creed, you know, essentially is, is getting people to agree, this is what I will do in coming to work for you and this is what we will do to support you as an organization. And then lastly is, to, is the way that you get good people is that you get referrals. Be sure to work through other people who are local uh, leaders or people who are business owners uh, or other uh, you know, elders in a community and find, um, you know, find out uh, if, you know, if you can uh, get the referrals from, um, from them who, to say you know, who are people that you know that are hard workers, who are people that you know that you know, are uh, ambitious, people who uh, want to uh, run their own business, etc. And so then you begin getting those referrals, and then when you approach those people, you can say, Hi, uh, George, my name is Scott Roy, and I was talking to Elder Simpson over here, and uh, I was asking him to refer really sharp people to me, and he referred you to me. And, uh, and I'd, I'd like to talk to you about a, a potential job opportunity. And that way, you can really recruit top-notch people, right? So that's a little bit about recruiting. Secondly, and this is, this is the biggest thing, if you walk away today, with uh, you know knowledge and understanding, this is the thing that I would love for you to know, and that is is that pitching people and convincing people to buy what people classically think is the way that sales should be done, which is you know pitching, convincing, uh, you know take it a little further into arm twisting and that kind of thing. That's absolutely the opposite of what great selling is all about. Okay, and so this is what we find almost everywhere we go. In fact, I can honestly say everywhere we go. Every client we have ever worked with uh, does one fundamental mistake, and that is they lead with promoting their value propositions, which are the features and benefits of a product. So the way that a, a really good marketing department works is they define a problem that a, a problem set that a product will solve, and then they design a product or bring out the features and the benefits of that product and then give that to the sales team. Unfortunately, that's the wrong conversation to initiate a sales call with. Okay? Now, this is something that just is game-changing, and we have done this not only in the developing world, but we do this with major corporations. I mean, we work with, you know, we're in the commercial sector as well, and we work with global giants you've heard of, and we don't talk about their names, but you would have heard of the names of these large organizations and the multi-billion dollars in sales. And they make these same mistakes too. Uh, so fundamentally, uh, is people lead with value, uh, the value proposition, which is the features and benefits, and then oftentimes people will say, "Oh, okay, well that's nice, and you know I'll think about it." So mistake number one. Secondly, is there zero listening that goes on? Uh, it's it's always a, you know the 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 pitch or the uh, this is what I need to tell you to convince you of the problem you have, and then here's my solution to your problem. And then thirdly, we oftentimes see almost always uh, no closing at all. Is that someone will go ahead and pitch the product and then sort of sit there and wait for people to respond and say, yeah, I want to buy it or I don't want to buy it, rather than leading them through a series of simple questions about whether or not the product is right for them and how they might afford it and then what are the terms and conditions. Okay. Now some of the lessons to learn from this are, number one, is approach with the problem not the value. So that means that you know, approaching uh, somebody and, and beginning to talk to them about the problem that they have, whether they realize they have it or not. And uh, so a good example of that would be in, the, um, in uh, sanitation is saying, you know, tell me, you know, what is the situation? You know, what, do you, what do you do uh, when you do your business? And, and you know, people will respond to that and say, well, what are some of the challenges with that? What are some of the you know, situations you have to put up with, or challenges you need to put up with, problems you need to put up with? And, um, and so then we engage people in a conversation about that, often using pictorial uh, booklets that help to tell the story and lead the conversation. And so uh, out of a 20-minute sales presentation, we would expect that the problem should be discussed and engaged in for about half of that time or more. Okay, and then the second thing that's really critical is being sure that the cost of the problem is actually identified. So, you know, in other words, what is it costing people? And if you can do it financially, if you can assign a financial cost uh, to uh, the problem, 
then what that does, that creates a sense of urgency for the client to go ahead and do something about it. So if, for example, if you, if you help to, um, I, I think in Bangladesh, I think there was a study that was done by the World Bank, uh, and uh, they came up with a, a sum of something like 100, and it costs an average family in Bangladesh in a rural setting about $141 a year uh, in expenses and costs of you know, missing work and extra doctor costs, et cetera. And, uh, and, and uh, that, when that number is arrived at and someone takes a look at it and go, gosh, you know, you know, over a five-year period, that's $700. You know, is that a problem that you'd like to solve? You know, is, that, is that something you'd like to get a, get a solution to so you're not wasting that money? And it's like, wow, yes, of course, I'd love to do that. Okay? So, but there's a way that you go about doing, and that is you don't tell them that the World Bank came up with that figure. You actually have to take people through a calculation you know, to help them see and understand you know, what the cost actually is. Um, when that's done properly, that's the time that the value proposition then is introduced. Okay? So you start with a problem proposition, you engage in conversation, and then you present the solution or the value proposition. And then, of course, most importantly, is lead them through a series of questions to ask them to buy. Okay? So this, I would say, probably more than anything is the greatest problem that we see out there in the field whether it's a WASH program or uh, you know, one of the other products that are designed for basic pyramid. Um, the third kind of key um, piece that we see is that you know, we see a lot of poor training of salespeople and sales managers. A lot of times organizations say, well, we just don't have the money to do this. We don't have the time to do this. And I, I usually come back and say, well, why are you doing this? You know, why are you in the business of trying to do this if you're going to do it poorly? You know, if anything is worth doing, you know, doing, do it well, you know, or don't do it, you know, because it doesn't make any sense to teach people, uh, you know, not enough information so that they can succeed. So I really recommend strongly that whenever you're setting up a, a program is that you budget a, a, a very solid amount of money uh, for making sure that you are training your salespeople and your sales managers well. Develop a curriculum and make sure they're, they're, they're being trained well. So the things that we see specifically is oftentimes is not the right subjects. You know, for example, I remember one organization, and I won't mention their name because I don't do that, but uh, the, uh, uh, I won't paint them green, let's put it that way, uh, but an organization that many of you probably have heard of uh, in, in the solar industry um, basically said to me, oh, yeah, we've got a five-day uh, training program. It's fantastic. You know, we don't really need to change that at all. And when I got in there to do the discovery work, what I discovered was over the five days, there was a total of about four hours of sales training in 40 hours. And the rest of it was all about product. Now, product training is important, but knowing about the product is not what's going to teach people how to sell it. So one of the things you've got to, you've got to do is make sure you have the right balance and looking at the right subjects to teach people. Secondly, people oftentimes don't take enough time. And another, another thing, oh, yeah, we have, we have a good sales training program. Really, tell me about it. Well, you know, we you know, come in in the morning, 9 o'clock, we meet, uh, we describe the product, teach them how to do it, teach them how to collect money, teach them how that's handled. At, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, we teach them um, an hour's worth of sales training, and then we finish with administrative stuff at, by 4 o'clock. That's our sales training. And I, and I just look at that and laugh, you know, in the sense that, you know, the right amount of time is probably about four days to five days in a given language to teach people how to sell well, well enough that they can go out and actually get, get uh, you know, results. And if you do that, then this will begin to give people more confidence. Uh, they go to the field. They are able to engage with clients effectively. They can make sales. And when they're making sales, they, they, they're happy, they're confident, their confidence grows, and then they stick with you, you cut down on churn, all the things that, are, you know, that plague most young sales organizations. Um, so not enough time is another key thing. And then thirdly, is failing to retrain and embed. Sometimes people believe or falsely believe that if you just teach it one time, it's enough. And in fact, um, what, we, what we believe is develop a curriculum and then reteach it about every six weeks. And the way you do it is you have people in a, in a training course for 
say four or five days, and then weekly or daily, depending on how you're set up, when you have sales meetings, you take a piece of what you trained people in the original training, and then you train it again, and again, and again, and again. And, and that's how you create embedding within your organization. So you could take a 15 minutes each day or 20 minutes each day in a sales meeting or every other day or once a week, whatever how you do it, and then just continue to retrain the material that you have. And that will help to build people's confidence. So here's some lessons. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll, you know, this, I made a mistake, by the way. Uh, <laughs> I, I sent the, the, the wrong slide, slide deck, so uh, don't pay attention to these lessons. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and verbalize them. First of all, uh, be sure that you teach skills on connecting with people and how to carry on a conversation. Be sure that what you're doing is majoring on um, teaching people uh, the selling skills and minor on the product knowledge. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean you should not teach product knowledge, but just make sure that the balance is stronger on the sales skill side than it would be on the, um, uh, on the, uh, on the technical side of the product. Now, if you have a very technical product you're selling, you may need to add more days to your school. But it's very important that you not shortchange the selling, uh, the selling training. Secondly, be sure that you have enough days and time. And thirdly, be sure that you set up meetings uh, that, that bring the material that was originally trained in the first uh, training cycle and, and you know, break it up into small pieces and continue to retrain it in a cycle. All right? So that's uh, a little bit about training. And then, and then uh, um, under promoting the best sellers to managers, this is one of the biggest mistakes I see as well, is that you get a top salesperson who has performed admirably. They're uh, a really effective um, uh, seller. They, you know, they, they're selling 10 toilets and everyone else is selling two. So the, you know, the, the assumption is they're going to make a great sales manager. If everyone else could learn what John knows how to do, my gosh, you know, we will blow the roof off of it. So we promote that person to sales manager. But unfortunately, we don't even give them any sales manager training. The problem is that sales management is almost diametrically opposite to sales skills. Okay? Selling is very, very much a selfish type of endeavor, whereas management is more of a team type of approach and team skill. So oftentimes a top seller, the reason they're a top seller is they're selfish with their time, you know, they're disciplined, you know, they do things rigorously. And they, you know, and, and, and when when you promote them to sales manager, they can get incredibly frustrated when they look at people wasting time and getting distracted and running all over the place. And, and they, the, the rest of the team does not sell like the top salesperson does. That's the problem. And so the, the, the issue is if you're going to take a top salesperson and make them into a manager, you're going to need to have a program to convert that. I, I mean, I can speak to this I mean, quite authoritatively from my own experience. My first year, this is, gosh, this is going back 40 years. Um, when I was 21 years old, I, I was a top salesperson and, uh, in my organization, and I was promoted to sales manager, and then I recruited a team of, of salespeople and uh, you know, went out with 10 people, and by the end of the selling period, I had one standing. I was an awful sales manager. And um, so what that required of me the next year when I went back was to really change my game, and my sales manager worked with me to be able to help me change my game. And that next year, I think I had three people working on my team, but all three finished the, uh, finished the season, and all three were you know, average or above average salespeople. So it can be learned, but there needs to be uh, training to make that happen. Um, and then the third thing, which is almost obvious, is real obvious, is that you'll lose a top producer if you just promote your best seller to sales manager. So you've got to be thinking about, if we do promote him to that, how do we continue to maintain the sales that he was bringing in or that she was bringing in and, uh, and, and, and at the same time you know, use their talent to help train other people? So here are the lessons I would say. First of all is define specifically what you want your sales manager to do. It's very easy to load all the jobs onto the sales manager and have the sales manager doing everything. And uh, you know, things like uh, you know, supply chain and logistics stuff and you know, all of that stuff, and that is a complete and utter distraction from what his or her job is, which is to train the sales team 
can help the sales team to do well. Secondly, is pre-trained sales management candidates. That means that when you're, you know, it makes a lot of sense that out of your sales team, you would promote somebody to be the sales manager. So what you want to do is take people who have promise, including your top salesperson, by the way, um, and and then begin to give them management duties. Very, define this, you know, this sort of senior sales representative job. Uh, it might look like doing field training with people in the field, and then teaching at the weekly meetings, and you know, doing some of the pieces of sales management to see how they perform at that and see how much they like it, because they may not like it at all. I know many organizations that we work with where they have their top sales guy in sales management. He doesn't want to be doing it. He doesn't like it. Uh, so, so you know, give this pre-training opportunity to give the you a, an opportunity to see how this person is performing at it, as well as give them an opportunity to see how much they like it and how well they're performing at it. And then last uh, lesson on this one is avoid making sales management more attractive than sales. Okay, and so it's very easy for, for people to look at management and think, oh, this is great, I can have a job, I can kick back, sit at a desk, and you know, my job will be easier now. And the more that you make sales management into the desired profession, the more pressure you'll have from your people to want to be promoted to sales manager. So uh, be sure that you really keep your, your sales people in, in the main focus as being king. Sales is king, essentially. If you're a salesperson, boy, you're the most important person you know, on our team because you're the one who makes sure that things get out there to the people that, that we actually accomplish our mission. Um, and then the last piece I want to share quickly here is just planning and managing territory haphazardly. I've seen this so many times where you know, you're working in an area, you know, several counties or whatever the designation for the, you know, for the um, area is called, and, um, and we see people make, uh, make a number of mistakes where they don't really think clearly about how they want people to use territory. So they allow salespeople to go anywhere. Uh, and which creates problems because people work over the top of each other. You know, they prejudge territory. They start thinking, well, you know, well, I'm not going to go there because they're, you know, that's not a good selling territory, but this is a good selling territory, et cetera. Secondly, is it allowing your salespeople to chase hot leads? So let's say someone buys a product from one of your salespeople and then says, hey, go talk to my brother, my sister, and by the way, my uncle lives in a village that's 10 miles from here, and I know he'll buy as well. And so people then will then literally leave their territory and get on a moto or you know, bicycle or whatever mode of transportation and go 10 kilometers away and either to face, uh, no, I'm not interested or uh, no, I don't have the money right now or just not being home. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's a real downer for a person who's chased all the way over there. It's inefficient use of time and, uh, and, and very, very unproductive. And then thirdly is spreading too thin. Oftentimes, um, organizations try to cover an area. Uh, you know, say for example, if you have a, a ten um, township area, does it mean you need to be in all ten townships over? Let's say the program is a five-year program. Does it mean you need to be in all ten townships today, or by the end of the program? And so get that clear with your funder, or whoever you know, whoever is is uh, bringing money to you or, or giving investing money in whatever you're doing, um, and find out. You know, what are the requirements? So oftentimes uh, what we do is we help people reorient their thinking, in, and that is to close down your footprint. Even though you need to be in 10 townships by the end of the program, start with one township, maybe half a township. But the tighter that you build a territory, the tighter you work it, uh, then the greater the learning, especially in the beginning, the greater the learning, the greater the lessons, the greater the problem solving. And so then what ends up happening is you, you, you really develop uh, extraordinary capability in a short period of time, and then you can begin to accelerate the spread of territory. So lessons in this is one is to define and assign territories. Uh, be, be very articulate about where you want people to go and the importance of them seeing everyone. Secondly, accumulate the leads that a person might get uh, from other areas. In, in the meantime, go to every door in your assigned territory, and then when that territory is completed, then those leads can either be shared with other people who are working in those other territories, or you know, then that person can then move to that new territory with those leads. But don't go chasing leads. And then thirdly, is tighten the territory footprint. Okay, just as I was saying before with uh, about the townships, uh, I could tell you a story, but time is running thin. Uh, but uh, uh, make sure you have a tight territory footprint where 
um, you, you, you can maximize learning in a very short period of time, solve the problems that are inevitable in the beginning of a, of a program, and, uh, and then you can expand more rapidly. Okay? Connie, back to you. Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, that was fantastic. Um, we've had some interesting questions come in already. I'll save them to the end, but uh, to all participants, please do note down your questions and feel free to put them in the chat, chat box now or to ask them later. Um, since we are running short on time, I'll hand straight over to you. Um, over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be with you, and I echo Scott's sentiments about how wonderful it is to look back in the past eight years and see the progress that we've made as an organization, but also as a sector in our learnings about how to do market-based um, sanitation at scale. So today, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about our learnings that we've accumulated over the last eight years across our six programs, and I'll jump straight in. Um, a little bit about IDE. For those who are unfamiliar, we are an international NGO uh, that has been around ever since 1983. And at that point, we were one of the first and only to talk about market-based approaches. And now market-based approaches um, are in vogue. Um, well, what does it actually mean to uh, take a market-based approach? Um, at its simplest, we believe that uh, the private sector, businesses, entrepreneurs, and customers can drive uh, social impact at scale. Uh, and it took us a while to realize that uh, the critical unit of impact um, in a market-based approach is a sales transaction. Right. Um, if you have a market, you have a buyer and a seller, and what happens between them is a sales transaction. And it's the transaction of that sale, whether people are selling and purchasing um, a toilet or a water filter or agricultural inputs, that enables people to improve their lives. Um, and so once we realized that uh, these market-based approaches hinge upon a sales transaction, that became a critical insight for us to embed uh, direct sales within our programs. What this looks like, however, uh, ranges um, depending on the market conditions that we are working within. So as Connie mentioned, we work in six different countries, and the market conditions are all very different, right? Like the available businesses um, to sell are different. Uh, we have very rural micro-entrepreneurs um, in uh, the villages of Ethiopia, all the way up to large, sophisticated corporate firms in Bangladesh who can mass produce plastic products. And what they are interested in selling and how they sell will range. And, um, as you know, people's preferences also differ across these countries. So our sales approach has to reflect these contextualized insights. So who are our customers? Um, this framework, some of you may have seen before, is the technology adoption lifecycle. And it's a framework that we use to understand our customers and segment our customers. Within any uh, market space, you will have innovators, those who are eager to try out new technologies and take a risk. Then you have a group of early adopters who are perhaps, once they see a couple of their friends um, with the new technology or product, are then willing to try it out. And then you have the vast majority of people who are the masses, right, who will um, purchase and use it once they know it's an established product where the kinks have been worked out and they know what to expect. And certainly you have some late majority people who are by definition late and only tend to adopt once uh, the next generation of products are on the market. And you will ultimately have those who are laggards. So the statistic I like to cite is that in the US, there's something like 0.01% uh, of people who still do not have refrigeration. And there will always be a small group of people who do not want to purchase, adopt, and use for various reasons. And our experience across our portfolio shows that this holds, and the sales tactics needed to target each of those different groups will be different, and you need to understand their drivers and barriers. So a little bit about our results to date. Um, I think one of the common questions around direct sales is how can you scale, right? Scott mentioned that um, people tend to think that direct sales is resource intensive. Um, in our experience, it certainly is, depending on the model you set up. But it is not 
um, in contradiction to scale. It will depend on how you set up your program model to embed direct sales, but just um, as evidence that you can scale across your six countries, uh, IDE has helped facilitate over 700,000 toilets, um, the two main programs being in Cambodia and Bangladesh, and both of those have integrated direct sales practices. So why direct sales? Um, as I alluded to earlier, you know, as a market-based approach organization, at first we just thought, well, if we prove the profit opportunity to businesses and they see that, you know, if they make a, a, a manufacturer latrine and sell it, they will make a profit, then they will be motivated to sell aggressively. What we learned, however, is that this isn't exactly true. Um, certainly there's the top LBOs, the latrine business owners, who are motivated to then um, promote aggressively around their villages and districts. But the vast majority of enterprises that we work with tend to want to wait passively at their shops and wait for customers to show up. Um, having seen the profit motive, they will happily invest in molds and produce stock to keep on their land, but many do not want to be doing the hard work of knocking on doors and, and facing a lot of rejection. And so while we were able to sell some latrines through enterprises themselves, we would not have hit the scale and the speed that we really needed to to achieve the MDGs and SDGs. So something had to change. What changed was that we realized we really needed people to get in front of customers. Um, as Scott mentioned, you know, selling a toilet is not the same as selling a pack of shampoo or a pack of cigarettes. It's a significant um, economic decision that a household needs to make. Uh, there's a lot of questions uh, from people around, well, what does the product actually entail? Um, they want to make sure that they can talk through uh, all the um, purchase requirements in terms of delivery, installation, financing. Um, oftentimes, they want to touch and feel the product so that they know what it actually looks like. Most people don't know anything about the underground parts of a toilet. And so it's a complex conversation that goes beyond just buying a one-time cheap packet of shampoo. Thus, especially in the sanitation space, we believe direct sales is really important for the customer to have a direct conversation with the sales agent so that they can have this, um, uh, this ongoing interaction and so the customer can trust in this transaction. Uh, this is in contrast to you know, the previous hypothesis of doing a retail model where customers will go proactively to the shop to, so to speak, pull it off the shelf. I think what we've learned in the sector is that for us to really achieve scaled results, um, sanitation is really a push product. You have to push it in front of people so people um, are forced to have a conversation um, because you're there and then they will then dive into whether or not um, they're interested in buying. So on this uh, slide, you can see a graphic of what this actually looks like. And this is a, um, a, a graphic representative of our sales model in Nepal. We have ring producers on the left. And what IDE does with ring producers is that we teach them how to produce the product. We do some basic business training. And we support them in understanding market information and advising around prices. Then they work with a direct sales network. Uh, sometimes it's sales agents that IDE helps recruit. Sometimes they have sales agents that they identify within their network. And so IDE provides training um, and advises them on sales strategy. Uh, we work with them to use sales tools, such as the site seller Scott was talking about earlier, and making sure that sales agents are working effectively with ring producers um, and negotiating around commission, territories, and targets. And then there are the customers, right? The customers who end up buying. Uh, and our, our role here is to monitor their customer satisfaction. And if there are any issues, communicate that with ring producers and sales agents. Um, in some programs, IDE also facilitates financing for these customers. Uh, and I will talk about that a little later. Um, this is a schematic representative of our Bangladesh program. I wanted to show you this just because um, it's a very different market environment, um, but yet we have found value in direct sales. This is kind of the inverse. So if you start um, at the bottom, we have NGOs like IDE and the Bangladeshi government. And here we have lead firms, the so large corporate firms that can mass produce products in the Bangladesh context. 
Um, in Bangladesh, we have been working with a company called RFL. They are a lead plastics manufacturing firm um, who makes a lot of the plastic products in Bangladesh, so chairs, buckets, and um, uh, about five years ago, we worked with them in American Standard to design the Sato Pan, which is now being mass produced and distributed through uh, Bangladesh. What IDE has done is then connect um, RFL, the lead firm, with various retailers and dealers along the value chain, all the way down to the local latrine producers who um, sit at the district and village levels. Um, recently, we've been connecting latrine producers with sales agents who are then, you know, again, having that face-to-face -face conversation with customers. So even in a very mature, sophisticated market with lots of players, you still need to go to the last mile with a sales agent to have that in-person conversation with households. So what have we learned across um, the spectrum of different markets? Now I'm going to talk about a couple of the learnings um, by category. First, I'm going to talk about market segmentation. Um, in order to sell someone um, a, a product, I, uh, what we've learned really well is that you need to be able to speak to their problems. And their problems can vary depending on how you want to categorize them. Um, one simple way to segment the market is by willingness and ability to pay. And that reflects the technology adoption curve. So what we've typically done with the market-based program is to target those who are willing and able to pay first, especially on cash, as they are the lowest hanging fruit. Then target those who are willing and less able to pay, so uh, they have the emotional willingness but just need some help with affordability. And we've done things like um, installment payments, connecting them with microfinance or uh, institutions to increase the affordability. And oftentimes in the markets we work in, the uh, late adopters and the laggards tend to be the poorest households. Sometimes they are not. Sometimes you have uh, non-poor households just for some reason are stubborn. Um, but oftentimes you do have poor households who truly need some form of subsidy and we have been able to integrate subsidy as part of the sales conversation. Another way you can segment the market is by unique needs. So for example, in our Cambodia program, we basically been promoting one standard product um, up until recently. Uh, so uh, from about 23% coverage up until 67% coverage, we've been promoting the Easy Latrine, which is the offset poor flush latrine. Um, as we move into the, uh, the final segments of the market, the last 35%, um, many of the people remaining in the, that segment need other product adaptations. So households who are living in challenging environments or households with people living with disabilities, and thus the product itself will not solve their problem, thus we need to change the product to address their problem. And finally, um, we have started to segment our market by different product preferences. Um, some people, you know, given their economic and social backgrounds will prefer a certain type of product over another type of product. And although we try to limit the product ranges because it can often confuse customers um, and can also confuse suppliers because they are learning to produce a new product already, you don't want to confuse them with too many products. But if the product is mature um, and people are exposed to the product category and understand what a toilet is, then you can start introducing different products for different preferences, such as different shelter types. A lot of you, I'm sure, have questions around, well, do you sell on cash or do you sell on finance? Um, of course, we are trying to reach those who are poor, and affordability can certainly be a constraint. And financing is one way to certainly increase the affordability, but it's important to note that financing is a complex process. Um, from the initial sales conversation and explaining the finance terms, you need a, sales, a skilled salesperson to do so. And oftentimes, um, if you're partnering with an MFI, they won't let you talk about the financing unless they're there. So that immediately creates a logistical challenge. And even if you are able to have a finance conversation, you need to go through all of the work of collecting applications, assessing credit worthiness, then disperse, dispersing and collecting on loans, which just complexify the entire process. So while financing can be extremely powerful in increasing access and affordability, it can also significantly slow down your sales process, uh, meaning that you might be missing out on customers and impacting more households in the short term while you are figuring out financing. 
Um, because financing has been so challenging with external partners, um, IDE has, in some of our programs, experimented with internal financing options. So in, um, in our program in Ghana, for example, we've launched a commercial brand called Sama Sama um, uh, with a toilet that uh, needs financing for most customers, and the capital markets in Ghana are really difficult to work in, and so Sama Sama has started offering installment payments directly to customers. Again, this is a solution, um, and you can integrate it with your sales process, but just be uh, aware of the operational financial risks. Um, a key learning for us in terms of having effective sales is the power of incentives, right? Um, and if you design incentives well, it will allow you to address multiple objectives. So incentives are powerful because um, they can be very immediate. You can have a monthly incentive for sales targets. You can have a quarterly incentive for sales targets. Um, or you can have qu quarterly incentives for behaviors that you want to reward. So for a while, while we were transitioning our uh, team in Cambodia from um, enterprise-led sales to sales agent-led sales, one of the key um, inputs needed for sales agent-led sales were sales agents. But our staff were not um, used to recruiting sales agents, so we had to incentivize them to focus on recruiting sales agents. For, for a while, um, we set up incentives based on the number of qualified sales agents they recruited. So it's a very useful tool that you can use um, in the short term and long term to motivate very specific behaviors that also are measurable and will keep your staff accountable. Um, oftentimes, however, uh, whether due to budget reasons or political economic reasons, financial incentives um, are not available, and that's okay. Um, I think financial incentives, money, can be a really powerful tool, but it is not necessarily the most powerful. It's just the one that you can manipulate the most easily. Um, there are other motivations that people have for doing a good job, and oftentimes when we're working with government volunteers or government um, officials, uh, it's not politically viable to pay them uh, a financial incentive. And so there are recognition ceremonies, there are, um, you know, a group uh, incentive that for the money to go to the village level that you can play with. So you can be creative with the type of incentives you use. If you are going to use incentives, which we strongly suggest you do if you do sales, uh, making sure that the incentives are aligned and having a strong verification system is key. Uh, you just have to acknowledge up front that people are going to try to find the loopholes, and so you're going to have to have a strong measurement and control system to be able to catch um, those loopholes and also make sure that the results are verifiable. So having accountability, transparency, and a robust measurement system is key. And alignment is really uh, important because Although the organizational bottom line might be to have high sales numbers and thus you know, high impact uh, at the household level, not everyone should be incentivized to hit high sales numbers, right? For example, your M&E team perhaps should not be incentivized to have high sales numbers. In fact, they should be incentivized to um, ensure the quality and fidelity and accuracy of the data. So making sure, again, that the objectives you want to achieve for each team are aligned with the incentive they are uh, receiving. Training and coaching. Scott touched on this a bit, so I just want to uh, um, reiterate some of this because it is important. Sales is not a, just a four-day training, even if you spend a full four days on it. We think it's like a sport. You need ongoing coaching, ongoing practice. Um, uh, so just as you will not learn how to play tennis in a four-day training, you will not learn how to do sales in a four-day training. Um, sales managers really serve as coaches and um, getting the right coaches in place who can understand how to motivate, who can talk to um, their sales teams um, in a way that is encouraging and skills building is really important. Um, in an organization, it's also important to build a tiered coaching system. Um, exposing everyone to the same sa uh, sales language is important so that uh, people have a shared vernacular. And again, money alone is not the answer. You can't throw money at a problem. Incentives are really important, but if they don't have the right skills and the right training, they will not be effective. 
And finally, uh, how do you scale direct sales? Um, is your model scalable? So in the case of our Cambodia and Ghana programs, IDE directly manages sales agents who are either part-time staff or full-time staff. Um, this is possible given the uh, market size in Cambodia, where it's only a country of about 15 million. If you're operating in, let's say, Ethiopia, where the population is 100 million, um, having an organization directly manage sales agents may not be scalable, right? So look at what are other units of impact that you can uh, uh, use uh, as leverage. So in Ethiopia, for example, and Vietnam, we work through the local government networks and engage the government volunteers um, in the role of sales agents. So if your model currently isn't scalable, um, look to what could be scalable within your political economic context. And in the last five minutes, I'll leave um, it for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Yi. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, really interesting. And we've had some interesting questions come in already. Um, yeah, so feel free to keep asking away in the chat box. Or if you'd like to press the raise hand button, we can unmute you. And you can ask your question directly. So uh, with one that we came that came through earlier. So Rosemary from Uganda asks, is the problem more to do with the supply or demand? The market will always opt for cheap and convenient ways. If dumping and poor disposal is cheaper, then they will opt for that. And if anyone, um, Scott or you, if you'd like to speak to that. Sure. Um, I think the question really t uh, hinges upon people's perception of price and price sensitivity. I think price is certainly um, a component of people's judgment about whether or not the sale is worth it. But we really want to focus on value. And value is you know, defined by benefit over cost. So it's not just the price. It's not just the cost that's important. But what is the value that people are getting out of this product or service? And that speaks to Scott's earlier point that we really should be making sure we are providing value and responding to people's specific problems and then they will stop the fixation on price. Great, thank you. Um, we also have this question. Uh, so is the sales manager the boss? Do they get paid more than the salespeople? I think it depends on what your setup is. Uh, I mean, some organizations believe that the salespeople should be paid more. Uh, I, I think it really, you know, it can be experimented with, but uh, I don't think that um, uh, it, it needs to be a major issue. Um, uh, certainly if a sales manager has done a good job in hitting high sales targets, et cetera, uh, managing through five or six or seven people, uh, and they sell more than what they could have done as an individual salesperson, they might make more money. Uh, but it doesn't need to be substantially higher. Um, so, I, you know, compensation plans are going to be are going to be very culturally bound according to the organization and the, and the area that you work in. Great, thank you. So we've had a few questions on fecal sludge management, um, asking both from Shelley and Camille um, if you've had any experience regarding FSM markets, if the lessons and models can be also applied there. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. Camille's was specifically to IDE, but I guess if either of you have experience, yeah. Yeah, I mean. Sure, I can speak to that. So uh, just a bit of context. IDE has a specific mission of working in rural markets, and so most of our work has been in rural markets, some peri-urban, but uh, again, mostly rural. And that has specific implications around what types of products are sold um, in the sanitation space, and often they're still decentralized household products. Um, our Cambodia program and Bangladesh program have started experimenting with uh, fecal sludge management solutions. In the Cambodia program, they are um, testing an upgrade pit um, uh, that is alternating, uh, ultimately. So it's very well integrated within the supply chain already. And um, our close rates have been quite high, actually, around 20%. Um, so customers are being uh, aware of the problems and the uh, conversations that we have with the customers about the upgrade pit are similar. Again, following that problem-led approach. So are you going to worry that your pit's going to overflow, um, as opposed to product uh, focus in terms of, oh, great, another three rings, right? So again, addressing their concerns. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, so Beverly asked, uh, 
please also comment on the added value of working with financing institutions to develop financial project products that clients can access. How then to equip the sales team to sell the, the finance product alongside the sanitation product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you spoke, uh, you spoke uh, very uh, articulately about that. Uh, it's a complicated process and um, you know, if you can do it without finance, uh, all the better. Um, and if you can bring it in-house, you know, then obviously that creates uh, unique challenges within an organization to have to manage that uh, process and, and you know, certain, be certain that you're not running afoul of any sort of governmental regulations that you may not be aware of. Um, and, then, uh, and then thirdly, um, you know, the, it's absolutely true that the, the financing mechanism will slow down the sales process. And so, uh, as you were saying, you're going to need to make sure that your sales team becomes very skilled understanding there's two decisions to make. One is the decision, do you, want the, do you want the product or do you not want the product? And the second one is, how are we now going to pay for it? You see, so there can be a commitment for the product, but it, you, know, you don't want to mix the two together. Okay? And uh, so, so that's, that would be the lesson. So as you set up your sales process, make sure that you have those two separated. Okay? Cool. Sounds like the willing and able distinction. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm aware that it's we've reached an hour, so if people need to dash off, then thank you very much for for attending. And um, for those that want to stay on a bit longer, if if possible, we can keep discussing the, the questions that are coming in. And I will post these all on the the forum, the uh, the Susanna forum, um, which I'll put a link to in the chat box. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, you and Scott, do you have to rush off now, or, or can you stay a few minutes longer? I'm okay to stay a few minutes longer. Yep, I can stay another five minutes. Um, I think there's a question from Beverly about integrating uh, sanitation marketing and CLTS, um, and if you have any experience on how a village can um, uh, actually equip itself with that kind of uh, approach. Yeah, I, I think I think the CLTS um, a, approach and, and sanitation marketing work beautifully together, actually, uh, because uh, one of the things that's nice about a CLTS, effective, and not just nice, but effective about CLTS, is that uh, it raises the issue of the problem very, very powerfully. Um, the part that we would we would disagree a bit with CLTS is the shaming portion of it because we don't think that that works as well. But, uh, but, but we do agree with the articulation def defining the understanding, the embracing of the problem as being a really, really effective way of getting people's awareness up to shake them out of the lethargy or shake them out of the sort of the cultural norm that people have been in for centuries, let's say. And um, I remember very specifically working with Cordell and, and Tamara in uh, in the first IDE program that you know that he was a part of as well. And you know we we were looking at you know do we need to have separate events or can can we have it combined? And I said well let's you know, let's just have the sales methodology actually you know tap into uh, a problem led approach would then which would then you know dovetail beautifully with CLTS. So um, uh, in, in some of the stories on some research I did recently out in Spidering Province, out in Cambodia, which is up near Vietnam, um, the, uh, the, the experience we had there was that the CLTS program would come in and actually you know, do the work they would do, and then the village uh, providers of, of concrete uh, latrines, et cetera, would then come right in and then uh, actually start supplying the latrines that people actually wanted to have installed. So I think it's a very, very good match. It was I think one thing to note when trying to integrate with CLTS is um, the CLTS frontline workers do a ton of work to get people to think about sanitation and motivate behavior change. When we have tried, uh, when we have tried to coordinate with them, they have come to us and just asked for sales training. Um, there are often volunteers who don't get paid for their work, and if they work so hard to have a conversation with the household, ultimately you want the household to adopt the product, right? And so. I have an idea about um, coordinating and training CLTS facilitators to actually then be able to sell a product effectively to the household. So why go through all of that energy, a one hour, two hour, sometimes three hour meeting, and not be able to sell to the household? 
More question for you. I know that IBE sells a lot more things than just uh, toilets, and so have you tried to sort of integrate over all the needs that a village has, and try to uh, bring sanitation, if you like, into a bigger perspective of development? Yes, um, we've looked at, for example, treating the pits. Um, and then using the treated sludge for fertilizer for agriculture. And from a technical perspective, it works. It has improved crop yield in, in the pilot we did. The challenge is also, uh, always at the commercial viability perspective um, because we do work in uh, less dense rural markets and the cost centers of transport and treatment currently do not outweigh or cover um, uh, outweigh the prices that people are willing to pay for these repurposed waste products. Great, interesting. Uh, we have a question here. In sanitation sales, is it always good to have a range of products, or are there any examples of sing single products being successful? I, I think the fewer products you have, the more successful your young sales team is going to be. Um, it's just, you know, over the years I've noticed that when you give a sales team too many things to present, they oftentimes will confuse a customer by presenting option one, option two, option three. Um, and, you know, I, I remember back in the insurance business when we, when we built an insurance company here in the United States, we had one product for eight years, <laughs> you know, and that company is well over a billion dollars today. But, uh, but you know, it's it discipline that that allows people to learn how to sell that product very, very well, especially if you have a product that has a broad appeal. So, you know, I, I, so I think this gets down to product development in the sense that the easy latrine and the, the, one of the beauties of this is it brought together um, uh, the different components of the toilet and made it easy for people to buy it. That's the name easy latrine, rather than people going out and have to get concrete and pipe and, you know, the slab of the pan and all that. So, um, so uh, you know, the, the, the nice thing about the Easley train is that it was one product that actually fit, generally speaking, many, many people's situation, you see. Now, if you're selling something that has a very specific and unique need, it meets a specific and unique need of just a small percentage of the population, then that can you know, yield more of an interest in a basket of goods approach, okay? So, so therefore, you know, you may have several products. So I think it depends on what is the product you're selling and then, you know, what is the general marketing uh, analysis that says, you know, is this how many people or what percentage of the population will this sell to or appeal to, I should say. I would just echo that. I think it's an important point because we get pushed on um, by lots of partners and donors around having a slew of products. Um, one, the R&D efforts are not cheap. It's inexpensive to design a well-designed product. Two, uh, it confuses the sales team and it confuses the producers, uh, and in addition to confusing the customers. So especially if we're working in nascent markets where sanitation coverage is low, which is oftentimes the markets we're working in, um, our experience has been to get the product category established first, start with one product, get people exposed to the idea of toilet before you introduce multiple kinds of toilets. In more mature markets, uh, then I think it's appropriate, but in the beginning it can really confuse people. And the argument has always been you want to give people options um, so they can choose what is best for them and have different ranges of affordability. Um, that's important. Um, but I think in order to be most effective with limited resources, start with one. And in terms of increasing affordability, there are other ways to do this through financing installment payments that get to that issue. Great. Um, I had a question about what happens after an ID project has finished. So um, who looks after the sales teams and sales managers then? Uh, so it depends. Um, if there are independent sales agents who uh, have no official affiliation with IDE, they can leave anytime. So the sales agents in Bangladesh, they're often just regular villagers working part-time, working on commission. And if they have something better to do, they are free to do that. Um, for sales agents who are IDE staff, one of the things that we try to really um, understand is what else can we push through this distribution network, right? We've done so much to build up this um, sales network, whether it's at a national level or uh, at a regional level. There are other products that can benefit from this access to villages. So just to give an example, with Hydrologic, the water filter team, um, for the last 
15 years they've been selling water filters and the sales team has become very sophisticated in having effective conversations with customers. They can also sell solar products. They can also sell um, maybe even toilets. And so it's really recognizing what is the value that you have with that specific team um, and what goal you have with that team. If it's a decentralized government network, obviously that's not within our control, but we can influence what other products move through that network. Well, I've, um, I'm aware that, that we're 10 minutes over time uh, already. Uh, the discussion is so interesting, I, I don't really want to, to bring it to a close. But, um, but yeah, thank you everyone for, for attending. And um, still a lot of questions that haven't been answered here, so I will be posting those on the forum. Um, potentially, I'll, I'll direct Scott and you to, to that post, and, and maybe they continue to contribute. Sure. Um, Thank you so much for your for your presentations and for the engaging discussion. It's really interesting, really beneficial. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you so much yeah. to Susanna for hosting. It's been great bringing yeah. so many people thank together. You. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.